Hello, happy Tuesday or Wednesday uh, for some of you. And March 5th this is our 8 a.m. Pacific time call. There was a question in the chat before we kicked off the recording about um, attendance in uh, Airtable form for this week. <clears throat> we will not <clears throat> capture that. Sorry, excuse me. Um, we'll be kind of revising and revisiting that process with this new allocator flow. Um, and also, uh, K-Ray will not be in today. Sorry, uh, you'll you'll have to deal with with me for this call. He'll be uh, he'll be back. Um, just taking a break. Uh, so, kicking us off, we have some updates around uh, new repos that are getting created. Uh, update from ETH Denver. Some comments around data cap compliance. Um, both reminders of the upcoming process, as well as a uh, update to. Um, a compliance issue from last week, um, covering some of the meta pathways and multi-sig address. There's a bit of a new thing that these allocators are going to need to do. This came up um, yesterday. So I'll talk to you about what all of that is. It relates to the onboarding flow um, for allocators to onboard to the tooling. There's going to be two things that really need to happen around them address creation, and a repo for bookkeeping. So we'll jump into it. Our schedule for the governance calls here, we're, we're already into March. It just is shocking to think. Um, time flies. We're going to be standing up a new allocator governance repo inside the Filecoin project. Um, most of you know that we've been using the notary governance repo for a long time. This is just going to basically be the exact same uh, use case. We're just kind of switching some things over. Um, it will still have a program readme with proposals, discussions, um, and there'll be sort of JSONs of all of the active notaries. Different tools that we're building, we'll be able to look at those JSON files. Um, tools that the community are building could pull from those JSON files and see who are the active notaries, what is their address, um, where are their records and bookkeeping being held, that sort of information. Um, so this shouldn't really be much of a change to, to the structure, um, just sort of helping clean up our existing repos. We currently have three, um, one for governance, one for the direct client onboarding, and one for large data sets, and we'll be sunsetting those three. So stay tuned. We'll move over certain information. We're not going to delete out things. Um, It'll just be kind of archived. Highlights from ETH Denver. I was there. Um, I I helped uh, with the Filecoin Foundation booth setup, but I didn't make it to the booth during ETH Denver. But I, I know there were a number of um, talks uh, at our Filecoin Foundation booth at ETH Denver. I know there are a lot of attendees that came through. Um, I don't know the timeline on those talks getting published. I went primarily for um, Dev Summit number three. Uh, Will was leading a track on um, allocators, and I got to, to help co-lead that, participate with him. We talked about retrievals and Spark. There was some kind of more open discussion around the structure of incentives. I gave kind of a recap to the election process um, <clears throat> and you know onboarding and, and where we are and what's coming. Uh, and then we heard a little bit from CEL about some sort of onboarding economics and ways that they're thinking about, um, you know, data cap in the funnel. So it was an interesting conversation. Those talks were recorded. I don't have the timeline on exactly when they'll get posted. I think they're still in post-processing. In the meantime, there's a really good recap sizzle reel from Iceland. Uh, if, you know, if you want to check that out. Um, but... We'll, we'll announce when those talks go live and, and direct people to them. But Dev Summit number three, big success. Talks of Dev Summit number four possibly being this summer in July. Um, TBD with that. All right, <clears throat> compliance and auditing. So we've mentioned this a few times. I'm going to keep saying it, try and keep hammering it home. The process is listed out here. What we're going to do is we have these new allocator pathways. Each pathway is going to get five PIBs of data cap. That's going to start happening this week and next week. Um, they're going to be getting the, that data cap. As that happens, they will start making allocations from that five PIBs of data cap out to their clients. 
when they have used 75%, which is about 3.75 pibs, to their clients, so they got about 1.25 pibs remaining, a audit will be triggered. The governance team will perform this audit. We have a draft that um, has been socialized some. We're working on increasing the automation for this. This is why it's really important that the bookkeeping is standardized. Um, because if everybody is using a totally different structure for their bookkeeping, it makes the audit process more complicated and much slower, which is not going to be good for you. If it takes longer for the governance team to audit all of your allocations, that slows down your ability to get topped up by the root key holders. So help us help you. After a pathway has used 75%, the audit is triggered. We are targeting a three-day turnaround, three-day SLA service level agreement. Um, we want to increase that automation. We think we can get it faster. We think we can start doing those audits sooner. So we don't need to wait until you've used 75%. This is our initial goal, 75%, three days. When that audit is completed, we are targeting a three-day turnaround for the, um, the root key holders to top it up. So once the governance team completes that audit and says, yes, we have reviewed this, it is in compliance, root key holders, please give an additional tranche of data cap to this pathway. This is per pathway. It's not per organization. It's not for the entire election cycle or program. It is per pathway. So if a pathway gets five PIBs and it takes them four months to hit this 75% trigger, then that's when the audit will happen. If it takes them three weeks to hit that, that's when the audit will happen. It would If, if a pathway goes through 3.75 PIBs in three weeks and is following their allocation plan, I'm going to be shocked um, because a lot of the applications had a pretty small initial allocation size. That's going to be one of the things that is really important. We will be auditing compared to each pathway's stated application. What were the replicas that you claimed you would require? What was the distribution you claimed? Is your bookkeeping happening? And is your allocation schedule being followed? If you are a pathway and you get five PIBs to start and you turn around and you give two PIBs to one client that you've never worked with before, that's brand new in this program, or that is brand new to your pathway, which would be everyone, that is going to be a flag. So. The initial proposal, if things are looking good, if you've used that 75% correctly according to your stated application, is that we will request a 2x top up from the root key holders. That's if all flags are green, let's double that tranche to 10 PIBs to the pathway. That's going to help increase scale and bandwidth for these pathways. It's going to give them more runway, and it's going to decrease some of the time between those audits, theoretically. That's our goal. And again, it is totally reasonable for some pathways to go at a slower rate, a smaller trickle. And that is normal and fine. And if that pathway it says, I don't want a big allocation, I only need this much, great. They can communicate that to us. We'll request that to the root key holders. And you know maybe it just stays at five pibs each time. Um, so all of these distributions, as well as the downstream deal making, is going to get audited. If there are things that are out of compliance, then perhaps it is not doubled. If depending on what is out of compliance, perhaps you will only receive another five pibs to say, let's give your clients an opportunity to start onboarding. Maybe they haven't done enough deal making yet to have sufficient information. Maybe there are certain things that are far out of compliance and we say, we are not going to top you up. You need to go revise your process and reapply in the future. So that is the process, a reminder, that's an update on kind of the timelines that we're thinking about. Um, we'll be, like I said, making more dashboards to increase the speed of this. <clears throat> that said, there was some non-compliant um, allocations that we were seeing. Uh, we found uh, there was a GitHub issue number 1101 opened by um, KZ. 
in our dashboard, there were applications um, or allocations that did not have an application. So there was no diligence link and they were getting two pibs of data cap um, with no uh, application evidence. So that does not follow the rules of the program. We just went ahead and removed those signers from the multi-sig. We are also pausing their um, the relevant allocator applications for this next round. So they can, they will not be receiving data cap right away. We can reach out to them. We'll talk to them about what may have happened here uh, and they can reapply when we move to the rolling applications. That's the update there. And now on to some of the things that allocators need to do. This information is most critical for all of the new allocators that are going to be using the open source tooling. For example, Julian, I see you on this call. You are mostly not using the open source tooling. You, As far as I know, you're building your own tooling. A lot of this will not be relevant to you because you are going to be managing your own allocation flow. This is for people who are going to be using the web interface that the team is building to action data cap app allocations. So this is context there. <clears throat> a little bit of background information. The structure of a direct allocation message uh, is slightly different than the structure coming from a multi-sig with a proposal and approval. So just a constraint that our tooling team um, is facing and getting this new tool ready in time. Uh, so our workaround is that we are going to set up a multi-sig with a threshold of one for each pathway that is using the tooling. This is not a multi-sig for all of the signers in a meta pathway. This is a multi-sig per pathway. For example, um, Will is here from the FIDL team, F-I-D-L, the Falcoin Incentives design lab. I think I got that right. The name has changed a few times. Um, this is the nucleated team coming out of PL. They're going to be, they have two pathways that they applied for and uh, were approved for. One for open data and one for enterprise data. I'm going to use them as an example throughout some of this. They have one organization repo uh, or organization project. They have two repos inside that. For each repo, there is one of their pathways. For their pathways, there is a multi-sig. They have multiple staff on their team. So they may have multiple signers just for security and redundancy on a multi-sig, but the threshold can still be one. That allows them to say if one person is uh, on vacation or, or takes a prolonged cruise trip somewhere, they're not facing some kind of operational slowdown. They have other people with a ledger multi-sig that could make these allocations. This needs to be a ledger because that is what the tooling is currently built for. So that when you use the web interface, you're going to sign in with GitHub and have your ledger connected to your computer. And it is going to send the, the message through your ledger for you to review and approve. That message can be just a proposal with a threshold of one that will still land on chain and it will still lead to a successful allocation of data cap. If you and your team would like to create this multi-sig and put your signers on it, you can do so. If you don't know how, don't want to do that, are not going to have time to do that, whatever, I, I'm signing up to do to solve this problem. I will be creating these multi-sigs. If I do not hear back from people by the end of next week, I will be creating these multi-sigs and putting the addresses on them. So the other piece of this is that there needs to be a repo for the bookkeeping. In the past, we have used a single repo, for example, the one large data set repo, and that had all of the issues where all of the applications were coming in. This is not going to be the case anymore. Each pathway needs a unique repo. 
those repos in GitHub can be consolidated under one project. So I said this a second ago, the Fiddle team has a project in GitHub. Inside that project, they have multiple repos. They have a repo for their open data set. They have a repo for their enterprise pathway. We are going to be releasing a bot that will install the various structures and permissions and connect you to the tooling. The way this flow is going to work, a client is going to submit an issue template. The bot is then going to convert that issue into a JSON PR. You'll be able to see it on the front end and action it for approval. When it is approved, it will merge that PR and update all the various records and APIs. We are building this backend infrastructure system. It's a big process. This is the, it's an evolution of the tooling that we've had since, you know, the early days of direct allocations and the large data set flow. Um, for you that have been using those tools in this ecosystem for a while, they're, they are a complicated set of tools. Um, we are building that to try and work for a lot of edge cases and a lot of different users. Um, it requires an amount of standardization in order to get to version whatever we're at, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0. So you could create these projects and repos yourself, just like you could go create the multi-sig with your addresses on it. That, I think, would be ideal because you will then be the owner of that project space and of that repo. If you do not do this, then I will be creating repos inside of the Filecoin project, and I will be adding people to them. But what that's going to mean is that I don't think there is ever a way for me to fully transfer ownership of the repo to another team. So bear that in mind as you are designing this. Um, Will just turned his his camera on because I think he has things to say on this. Just one point of terminology. You've been using the word project and project space. Uh, I think what you mean there is organization. There is a different term in GitHub that is project. We don't oh, really? need GitHub projects. We need GitHub organizations, which is your user or organization. Uh, and it is really just you will be making a repository that will be your segment of what previously was the LDN repo. So there's now a repo for each allocator pathway, which is the subset of the client activity that previously was all unioned together in the single LDN repo. Great. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Let's. So this is the. This is not a project. This is an organization. Got it. There's projects here that are something different. In case you didn't know, ah, I am not an engineer. So GitHub organization, currently the organization that we have been operating out of is the Filecoin project, which is why it messed up my brain. Um, and there are 261 different repos inside of here. We will have you create your own organization and repo, or I will create repos um, for the different pathways. But then I will be the owner. There is an Airtable form here. Let's see if I can grab that link. I cannot. Um, this Airtable form is very, very short. It is just asking you to uh, select, get it open so I can show you. Um, so your table form should be. Short, sweet, simple, to the point. You're going to select an option here. This is your, th these are the GitHub application issue numbers. So if your number was like number 990, uh, you'll select that. It's going to then link this information back and forth for us. And then we are asking you to, to repeat it and put your org name here. Um, oh, I got to change that. Uh, this is just going to help us with our bookkeeping, these like first three. Now, do you already have a multi sig Big, configured and set up that your team is going to use. Yes, great, super. For example, Fiddle, pretty sure they already have multi-sig set up. No, we don't have a multi-sig. 
someone else is going to set it up for us, that would be me on the Gov team. Great. Then we're asking a repeat. This should be a repeat question. We have asked this before. We just want to confirm a ledger address that is the primary address where you want your data cap to go. If you have already set up a multi-sig, um, this could be that address. This is where you would like the data cap to go if you are using a multi-sig already. And any additional ledger signers that you want put on here. MPG, I'm getting some, some feedback. Um, and then the URL link to your GitHub repo. Again, this is a repo per pathway. So all of this is for the new allocator pathways that are using the tooling that are going through those like meta pathways and using our front end. For example, if you are building a market-based system and you are designing a different end-to-end -end experience, you do not need to provide this information. We The address that you have provided previously is where we will send the data cap. You need to know how to get that data cap from that address to your clients. So for example, the, an auto verifier that's using a different front end system and not going through this flow, you don't need to provide that. We will need to know if you're going to use the bookkeeping that we are offering, we need to know the repo where you're gonna do the bookkeeping. That'll help us. Um, okay, Eric, question. Yeah, according to the Airtable, uh, there is only two options. Uh, I already have a multi sign, and uh, I want to, the government's team to help me to set up the multi sign. So, how about we don't need the multi sign? Uh, we just uh, have the direct allocated to uh, the, the data cap to the client. So, what, what can we choose? The if you are using, if you're using the front end tooling, you have mm -hmm. to set up. A, you have to use a multi sig for now. Oh, okay. If you are going to use the existing tooling to get clients to submit an application, review those applications and send them data cap from a ledger using the front end web tool. If you are using okay. that tooling, it has to come from a multi-sig for now. That is a constraint to using this front end system. So the same way that Previously, people would sign in to fillplus.fill.org. They would see all of the large data sets. They would see which ones already had a proposal, which ones were waiting for approval. If you are using that type of tool built by and released by our team, it needs to come from a multi-sig. So that is why it's <laughs> those two options. Okay, understood. So it sounds like there's a... Uh... There will be the brand new tooling web UI for allocating the data cap. So uh, uh, a live uh, streaming or training or maybe a video to help us to, to know how to use that uh, web UI will be better yes. to help us. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yep. It is still this week. We are hoping to get the data cap to the ones that are ready once they have gotten connected and they can start getting client applications, then we can start having um, more recorded show um, onboarding tooling demos. But as it is right now, here is a early screenshot of the beta version. Um, and it is going to be an evolution of the fillplus.fill.org tool, where you will see the issue number, links, information, and you'll be able to sign it um, and if you are using this web tool that we are paying pretty penny for, then that needs to come from a multi-sig for now. Um, and that is where we are. Okay. Uh, specific repo name. Um, if you are going to create your own organization and your own repo, ideally you name it something that matches the pathway that would make our lives a lot easier, but there is not uh, a requirement on the like nomenclature or structure of the repo name, but it would be very helpful if that name kind of is aligned to the pathway. Okay, 
other questions. So we need a multi-sig, we need a repo. This week, we're getting that tooling ready for the go live. Um, teams are setting up their allocator repos and giving us that information. Starting next week, allocators are going to be receiving data cap from root key holders. So as we get these forms submitted and we have, we've completed the checks, we have the address confirmed, we either make the multi-sig ourselves or you make it, we have the repo, you'll start getting the data cap. This means that teams that are not in these meta pathways will also start getting data cap this week and next week. So teams that are building their own tooling, not using this structure, they'll be getting their data cap at five pibs this week and next week. Um, as that happens, this is our existing landing page where clients were going to apply. We're going to be making updates to this landing page. Clients will still be applying directly for data cap. As we sunset the LDN v3.1, as we sunset those existing repos, clients will need to come back and open new applications to the new allocators. I am not going to manually go take any existing open applications and recreate them to a specific pathway because I don't know the allocator that they want to use. So clients are going to need to come open new applications. Um, they're going to have a unique uh, GitHub repo per pathway. We're going to get links to those different pathways on that landing page. The questions are going to be a little bit more standardized, um, but because they're owned by that uh, pathway, they can make those edits. They're going to, clients will apply using a GitHub issue template. There's some new updates to that since the, the last time we've done this. Um, and like I said, that is going to open the issue. The issue will then get converted by a bot into um, a PR and a JSON. It'll then show up in the new application registry. Uh, this is a sample uh, beta URL, so don't uh, you know? Don't get committed to this. But this is currently what it is going to look like. This is where allocators will action by approving those allocation requests. All data cap distributions need a bookkeeping repo. We need some place where we, the governance team, can go audit the compliance. This is what we're asking for, for most of the people that are using our tooling are going to be making that repo. It's going to be structured the same. The handful of people that are making automated market-based different allocator pathways, we need some link. Hopefully it was already provided in the application. If not, you could use the form, but we need some place to go to see your diligence. And we're going to keep working on making standards and writing out what those standards are because we want more teams building these automated pathways and we want clean and easy standards for how we audit those automated pathways. Okay. Um, there's a way for an allocator to remove the data cap allocated to a client before it's fully consumed. Yes. On chain, there is a process for removing data cap from a client. It requires two notaries and then an approval by the root key holders. We have a team that is getting close to completion on the um, on some tooling to make that faster uh, and make it more um, automated. Because what we can do, what we have been working towards in the background, we've given a few updates on this. Um, we made two notaries that only had, I think like 32 GB of data cap. And that was just, they were notaries for the sake only of this automated data cap removal process that creates bot addresses on chain that are on the notary registry. And what we can then do is we can write a set of rules that say, if, for example, a client has stale data cap that they have not used in X amount of time. If a client is out of compliance based on these automated tools, we could go ahead and automate a proposal to remove any remaining data cap 
until that client comes back and shows signs of life or better activity. And those two notaries would kick off that data cap removal and it would then go to the root key holders. The root key holders would not be automated. They would still need to go check the diligence. Why are, is the bot requesting this removal? What's the bookkeeping record? The root key holders would then go have um, and approve that removal from a client. It would require a FIP to change this structure. For example, one of the things that's been discussed, can the person who gave the data cap to a client remove it themselves without any additional check? That would require a FIP or some kind of complicated smart contract that got set up when the data cap was initially given out. That I think would be harder, but because of the way the 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 like Lotus command is structured, it's two notaries, and then approval from the RKH. The reason for that is because tracking data cap is kind of a first in first out system. So, for example, there's ten people on this call. If let's say all ten of us were notaries, or in this case, allocators, and all 10 of us gave an allocation to a client, like me and Eric and Will gave an allocation to you, Julian. We gave you different amounts. You then go start doing deal making. If I, if there was a rule that said the person who gave you data cap can remove that data cap, it wouldn't need to be this complicated math to say, if I gave you 100 TIBs, I could only remove 100 TIBs. But if Eric gave you 200 TIBs, the way that it tracks from one client address is just first in, first out. So there's this case where I could go remove 100 TIBs from you, even if you, in your mind, used 100 tips for me correctly. And then the next set, the next tranche was from Eric for 200 tips. You use that differently. We get into this like more complicated sort of social determination. Okay, one and, question. So, so yeah. what about the, the data cap conception? Let's say one address get data cap from two different notaries. Uh, and some of the deal doesn't follow the rules that has been defined by one notary. How do we know that these deals belong to this notary? I mean, this notary is accountable for these deals and not the other one. Exactly. That is like exactly a social problem. This is why programmatically we want people to use a unique client ID for their like project requests. And we think that we can get, we think we can make that a tighter flow as we go forward, where when you apply to an allocator, if you have received, if the client ID you use has received data cap from somebody else, we could okay. kick back an automated thing and say, you need to use a new address. Okay. So I'm I'm trying to tell you and balance the rules as written on chain with sort of the social realities. Socially, peop, we can tell people you need to use a new client address, but if they show up and they use the same address and they get a bunch of allocations on chain, the way it's structured now, we can't we can't force them to use a new address. We also can't force it to trace this data cap to this address was from this notary and this deal was using this pool of data cap from that notary. It's just going into like one place per can client. We at least, can we at least enforce the data cap allocator to ensure that they check that before providing you just yeah i think i know that we've had this in the past with the large data set flow where it would check at the time of application creation when someone applied it would check if it was a new address or not um and it's checking as far as i know it is checking the historical application record because there's another thing where if a client has if a client address has gotten data cap but then it has used that balance completely is that uh, the same 
is that like a similar problem? So what we, this is again, why it's like difficult. The more that we create these diverse pathways, it becomes harder and harder to make sure we, we keep these kinds of like rules standardized. Um, I think the goal is that at the time of application creation, at least in this like manual flow, we are looking both historically at other JSONs to see, is this a new client? Um, and I think we want to look on chain to see if this client has data cap to check data cap balance. But I think it's a, I think it is from my understanding, I think it is a harder problem on chain to see if they have ever received data cap than it is to see if they have a current balance. So I think when you just do the command is like check client data cap. If they've received it, but they used all of it, it just returns zero. Versus saying like they yes they have they were a verified client in the past, but yeah, now but the, they are not. The, the getting I think the problem you mentioned before is when there is two data cap allocation running at the same time. Right. Correct. Yeah, that's the bigger problem that we want to avoid, and that's where we want to. And this again is like. For you, Julian, as you're making your own tooling, when a new client comes in, or if you're managing the client IDs yourself, the the standard should also be on you to say, check that this is a person who is getting data cap, and then ask them to give you a different address. Other discussion points and questions. Covered a couple of things. The big thing here is fill out this Airtable form, either set up a multi-sig with your team, um, one multi-sig per pathway, or ask me to do it and I'll do it. Um, and I'll put myself on there uh, and then we'll remove me once, because um, I can remove myself uh, once we get everyone connected and we know that you're able to use the tooling and set up the organization in GitHub and the repo. Um, so those are the two asks for people on this call. Uh, Will, anything else you wanted to add to that or anything you wanted to correct me on? Nope, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, for the tooling, um, we may also have a GitHub app that you install on that repo and that gives it the permissions to uh comment on issues and stuff without uh hitting quota issues um but uh i don't think we are ready to roll that out yeah 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 that is a a, a target goal is that there will be a uh, app bot installation so that once you give us this repo we will point you to that app and that app will help complete that setup and onboarding process. It's going to be great. There's not going to be any problems. There won't be any bugs or glitches, and it will work perfectly in every edge case. With everyone's camera off, I don't know if you're picking up on my sarcasm, but um, if there are no other uh, questions or discussion points, um, then we'll go ahead and give everybody 18 minutes back um and see some of you in about 12 hours stop the screen sharing and thank you hey uh, Galen. so when, when should we submit the uh, the allocator ledger made metadata form the air table form where is the form i mean the air table Yes. What about it? Uh, when should we submit oh. that form? I mean, what's the deadline? If you, if, if you uh, the deadline will be before the end of next week, before the next governance call. If we don't get it submitted before then, I am going to do it all myself, which means I will own the repo, um, which is okay. less ideal. Um, the reason I will go ahead and do it myself is because this is slowing people down from from getting the data cap and getting onboarded so if you can do it before the next governance call that's mm -hmm. great um because it's 
create the repo, create the multi-sig. If you cannot do it before the next governance call, I will do it. <laughs> um, that's the that's the goal. So oh. there's the there's the Airtable form link again. Um, hopefully, hopefully it's easy because I'm gonna have to do it like eighty times. Okay. So regarding to the multi sign, uh, the configured is there any guide uh, book to teach us how to set up the the, the configuration? Um, so how to set up the multi sig? I have done it historically using Lotus directly. That is okay. um, not the easiest way to do it. The Glyph team has uh, launched tooling now to um, manage multi-sigs. Uh, so on the Glyph website, and I'll mm -hmm. drop this link here. Um, yeah, I haven't, helpful. yeah, I haven't used this um, tool yet, but it looks really, it looks great. I'm very excited. You can create a new multi-sig. It has you connect your wallet um, by connecting a ledger. Um, I trust the Glyph team. They have been in the ecosystem um, for a long time. So I, I feel pretty confident um, in the tooling that they're building. But I've used it to connect my ledger before to configure ledger settings on things. Um, but you can connect your wallet. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. And then manage uh, multi-sigs and manage the signers um, that are on that, that multi-sig. So... If you want to go uh, play around on this and, and look at it and see um, the Glyph tool uh, has a web-based um, multi-sig tooling, which I'm excited about. I love when we get more and more of these like web apps um, to manage like chain things. One of the things that I have long wanted and have never, I just have not prioritized or pushed for is getting better explorers that are tooled for the Falcon Plus program. It's like right now, Phil Fox does not report things like data cap, but right? When you go to Phil Fox and look at an address, you don't necessarily see like data cap balance. It'd be great for like more web tools um, that are designed for the Phil Plus program or care about the Phil Plus program. I mean, that's just me. Um, if there are no other questions, I will uh, cut off the recording and then I'll see, like I said, I'll see some of you guys um, in a couple hours or everyone else. Uh, sorry, Enjoy one the rest more of your question. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. For it. I'm sorry. Uh, so there was the two column. One is the primary ledger address. So another one is the additional ledger signer, right? So if I have only one ledger, so what should I key into the additional ledger signer? To keep the same oh, address? I probably made that. I probably made that question required and it probably won't work. Let me- No, I think that one should be yeah. optional. It's not the default answer because I Fixed saw the it. red mark there. Fixed it. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, Galen. Yeah. And let's fix that. Um. If you refresh that Airtable, uh, it should now um, I think I have fixed the decimal places for the issue number. Let me check on that. And I think the additional ledger signers should be fixed as well. Okay. Let me table check. We're just doing it live. Uh, from my side, it's still the default yeah. answer. Maybe I can reload it again. Let me check. Let me reload mine. Additional ledger signers should not be required. Issue number. That's interesting. Let me generate a new 
and generate a new link. That's okay. Maybe you can Maybe post it takes the link a second. In, a, in a Slack. We can yeah. take the update one. Yeah, I'll try and figure out why. Uh, and it might just be that it takes a minute for that to propagate out. Um, all right, I will figure that out before the end of the day, um, before the next call and see. And I can also post in, um, we'll post in Slack after the next call either way. All right. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening if you're in California. Good day, wherever you are. Uh, this is our second uh, version of the Falcon Plus governance call for March 5th. Welcome. Um, K Ray is, is uh, out, so you have the joyous pleasure of my company for, for this call. We're going to cover a couple things, um, some information about GitHub, some updates from ETH Denver, um, some talks about compliance. Um, some requirements for allocators that came up just in the past day as we work towards onboarding, and then we'll have time for uh, some community discussion or anything else that comes up. So jumping in, as usual, our link is here uh, to add the governance meetings to your calendar, and you'll have any time we need to change a link or, or edit the schedule, you'll be able to find that. I can't believe it's already March. Just plugging right along. We are going to be sunsetting some of our repos as we make this transition to allocators. We've been using three different um, GitHub repos, the direct client onboarding large data set, as well as the notary governance repo. Um, we'll be switching over to a new allocator governance repo. We'll be posting that everywhere. It'll take a while for us to migrate some of the things over, but this is gonna have some Similar use case and similar content. There'll be some of the kind of overall program read me with information, as well as space for proposals and discussions. Uh, and then we'll also have folders with some JSON records of active notaries. And this is so that we can build tooling that pulls that notary information, that allocator info, um, but also other teams or other dashboards that want to track who the current active allocator and notary set they'll be able to find that in a structured way. So stay tuned for more as we you know, make this make this migration over. Some highlights from ETH Denver. Um, I was there last week. I looking at the um, participant list. I'm not sure if anyone else on this call um, was able to join in Denver. Um, I was not there for the big ETH Denver uh, setup. I know the Falcon Foundation had a booth there were a number of different talks. Uh, we caught a lot of interesting traction. I was there primarily for Dev Summit number three. Um, we There was a whole day of content for Falcon Plus, along with a couple of other different tracks in that there were talks around retrievals and um, Spark. There was some kind of more open discussions around the incentive structure. I gave uh, an election recap as well as some updates about tooling and onboarding. Um, and then from CEL, there was a talk about sort of some of the uh, onboarding and incentive economics. So there, those were recorded. They are finishing the post-production on those talks and they'll be um, collating all of those and posting them. I'm sure they'll get posted to YouTube and we'll we'll post those in the Slack channels as well. In the meantime, there's a, there's a sizzle reel from Dev Summit number two in Iceland. Um, you can check that out and you know, get the get the hype uh, train rolling. Um, there'll probably be another Dev Summit later this year, maybe mid-year in the summer. I think some of the talks, very, very early rumors um, are around something in July um, in Europe, but we'll just see. So this is going to be uh, a repeat from some of the information uh, that we've been giving throughout this election cycle but wanted to just keep hammering home this process as well as give some updates on some of the um, kind of date timelines that we're trying to target. So 
we'll jump into this middle section around process. The goal here is that all of the allocator pathways that were approved in this election round will receive five PIBs of data cap to start. After that pathway has used 75% distributed out in allocations to clients. So when they have about 1.25 PIBs remaining, an audit by the governance team will be triggered. We are currently targeting a three-day SLA turnaround for that audit. We're working to increase the automation available. We'll get faster at these as we do them and we build more tooling and dashboards to support it. Uh, but one of the things that is going to make this possible to hit that three-day time is some standardized bookkeeping. If each, if every pathway was doing their record keeping and their compliance um, in, a, in a totally different system, and some of those systems were closed and the governance team needed to go track down additional information, that is going to slow down the process for your pathway getting approved for additional tranches of data cap. So in this call, we're going to go over a couple of the tooling things that are going to be required for teams that are using um, some of the open source tooling that we're making. Uh, if you are building your own full end-to-end -end tooling for doing compliance, um, doing your data cap distributions, you will still need to do this record keeping, this, this bookkeeping in a place where the governance team can audit it. And that is so that we know for all of the allocations that you make out to clients, are they in compliance with your stated application? So things that we are going to look for are around replicas, distribution, number of storage providers, the fact that you are doing bookkeeping. If you submitted an application that said you will work with clients that use this kind of deal making, that use this kind of data replication, that use this kind of retrievability, we are going to go audit and see if your clients accurately match your stated application claims. Once we do that audit, Again, goal is when you hit 75% distributed out, we will do an audit. Well, within three days, we'll have the results. We will then target three-day turnaround from the root key holders for a top-up. Our initial proposal is that if all of your allocations are in compliance, so if all of your distributions down to clients, if all of their deal making, if all of your subsequent allocations are in compliance with your stated application and the program parameters, then the governance team will request a 2x data cap tranche from the root key holders. So every team will get five. You've used 3.75 PIBs. You gave it out correctly. You had an allocation schedule that said, we will only do first allocations of 50 TIBs. We will require five copies across three locations before we give subsequent allocations. If all of those are true based on the tooling that we have and the bots that we have looking at your um, deal-making behavior, then we will request 10 TIBs to that pathway. You use 75%, another audit will happen, everything is in compliance, 20 TIBs. This is our initial proposal to the root key holders and to the community. Um, if there are certain allocations that are not in compliance, then the question will be, how much top up should we offer? If it is something like, you know, you gave out first allocations to clients and there were a few of those allocations where they have yet to do deal making, and we don't have sufficient evidence, we may not say, let's do a doubling of 10 PIBs of data cap. Let's do just another five while we wait for some of those clients to start onboarding. If there are allocations that are outside your allocation schedule, if you said you would give 50 TIB first allocations, the governance team approves you for five PIBs, and you turn around and give a two PIB allocation to a client, you are probably not going to be renewed. The governance team is going to find that you your audit uh, is out of compliance with your stated program, and you will 
we will not request more data cap from the root key holders. We will remove remaining data cap balance. So the goal here is each team told us how they would be in scope, how they are performing diligence, how they are going to hold their clients accountable, the expectations that they have for their clients and their clients' storage providers. If you follow your application plan, things should be good. You should be able to continue scaling up the amount of data cap that you get. I don't anticipate that this doubling is going to you know, continue um, to infinity. There will probably be a maximum that we hit. I also know that certain pathways are going to go faster than others. That is expected. We want to see how these different pathways scale and how much traction these pathways get at the different levels. Some of these enterprise pathways are going to go through data cap with higher tranches faster. Some of the automated ones are going to be giving out lots of small allocations. That is expected behavior. So the goal here is that your pathway will be audited at 75% distribute, distributed to the clients to see if you are in scope. That said, um, in the past couple of weeks, we did see a couple of um, notaries on the large data set uh, multi-sig that were giving out two PIB allocations. Um, and according to the tooling that we have, there was no evidence of um, due diligence to back up these two PIB first allocations. Those are outside of scope of the program parameters. So we went ahead and removed those signers from the LDN. There were um, some of those teams that were also had applied to be allocators in the selection cycle. And we are pausing uh, their application approval while we continue to investigate. They may reapply when we move to rolling admissions. Uh, and we look, we will be looking for additional explanations as to what was happening with these um, out of scope allocations. So this was tracked in a notary governance issue. Um, it's been closed, they've been removed from the LDN. And also, uh, to my knowledge, the LDN multisig is now drawing down its last um, tranche of data cap. So moving on, a couple of things. This is going to be important information uh, for people, like I said, that are expecting to use the open source tooling from the governance team and from the, that's going to be kind of built and supported by the new nucleated team, FIDL, F-I-D-L. Uh, this is the team that's nucleating out of PL. They have submitted two allocator applications for an open data set pathway and an enterprise pathway. They are going to be the primary stakeholders building the tooling and making it available to everyone else in the community that wants to use it. One of the things that has come up, and this is just as we are working to go from beta testing um, into full launch with this new allocator flow, is that we need these allocations to be coming from a multi-sig for now. Um, this is news as of yesterday um, from our development team. The structure of a direct allocation message is different than the structure from a multi-sig that uses a proposal and approval pair. The tooling was built primarily um, as we, as most of the allocations were coming through the LDN multi-sig flow, the tooling was optimized for that. As a result, that is some of the structure that we're going to need to keep for now. What this means is that for the 70 some odd allocator pathways that said they would be using the open source tooling, we are going to make a multi-sig for each pathway. This is not the same as the previous system where we had one multi-sig with all of the notary signers and all of the data cap was flowing out of that one multi-sig. Instead, we will have one multi-sig per pathway. So I mentioned a second ago, um, the Fiddle nucleated team has two pathways. They have an open data pathway and an enterprise pathway. That team is going to have two separate multi-sigs. This is also useful from an operational standpoint because that team can put four or five of their staff 
on those multi-sigs as signers. And if there's an issue with the technology, if a team member um, is on uh, an extended vacation or holiday or, or something, there are redundant signers on staff that could handle it. So to manage this constraint, one, these things still need to be a ledger address. Two, I am willing to take on the lift to build all of these multi-sigs and put the addresses on them. Um, it, we are going to initially set the threshold as one, which means that any one signer on that multi-sig will be able to action and send those messages. Certain teams already are ready for this world. Like I said, the Fiddle team knows they want to use a multi-sig. Other teams in their application have told us they want to use a multi-sig. But a lot of teams, this is news to them. We are going to give you two weeks to either create your own multi-sig and put your own ledger addresses on it for all of the staff that you may want on that multi-sig. Otherwise, I will create a multi-sig for each pathway, one multi-sig per pathway, and I'll put the addresses that were put in the application on that multi-sig. Once we get everyone connected to the tooling and allocations are flowing, I will then go and remove my address from that multi-sig. So I'm doing this just as uh, you know administrative support to help get the tooling uh, set up and working. I understand it is not necessarily the ideal for it to be a multi multi sig that I create. That is why we're giving people the opportunity to do that themselves. Um, if you are not able to or do not want to do that, I will handle that. This is a necessary step for getting access to the tooling. Next has to do with bookkeeping. Historically, like I said, we have had two repos where we track all of our diligence bookkeeping, the direct client onboarding and the large data set repo. The structure of the tooling that we are building wants an individual repo for each pathway. This is different uh, than some of what we expected, but this is the current you know, get out of beta and go to development um, expectation. So the Fiddle team, for example, set up their own organization in GitHub. And within that organization, they will have two separate repos. Um, where we have currently been doing, you know, most of our work in this project um, is under this Filecoin project organization that has currently 261 um, repos inside of it. That includes the notary governance repo, that the direct client onboarding repo. Um, this is a space that's owned by a, a different team in the ecosystem um, and collates a lot of that information. Similar to the multi-sig, we are giving these allocators an option in the next two weeks. They can either go create their own organization and repo and provide us with that URL link to their repo per pathway, or I will create those repositories inside the Filecoin project. To my knowledge, if I create those, then I and the owners of that um, Filecoin project org space will be owners of those repos. We can add other administrators, but we will remain owners throughout the life cycle. You are able to fork a repo, but I don't think you can change the ownership of it. So if you are designing tooling, um, if you are wanting to be building more of an end-to-end -end client experience, if you're gonna have more code, my advice would be to stand up your own organization in GitHub stand up your own repo and provide us with that information. If not, I will create those repos similar to the way that I will create the multi-sig, but I don't know that I will be able to fully remove myself as an owner. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, we are pushing to have a app 
uh, from our development team that is going to basically be a bot that you install in your repo. So if I create them in the Filecoin project and I make that repo, I will add that app to each of the repos. If you provide me with your URL to your own repo in your own organization, you will install this app and it will then handle some of the setup and structure and some of the permissions. It will make some of the templates that you need and it will allow the front end to handle the bookkeeping so that when you go to the front end tool, you will see client applications, you will be able to action them and the bookkeeping will be standardized and consistent. Like I said a couple slides ago, this is important for us to be able to do our compliance check so that we can have a quick turnaround. We'll be able to point more tools at these standardized JSON files, and we can do a lot faster processing of compliance. The flow is going to be, uh, once you install that app, for example, a client will submit an issue template. Um, GitHub now has some new like template structures that are much more powerful. That, like I said, that template will be standardized for people, but then you'll be able to push tweaks to it and PRs. Um, the bot will convert that issue into a JSON PR. You will then be able to see it in the front end web interface, similar to where we've been working in philplus.phil.org. Once you approve it, um, if, it if it meets your diligence requirements, it will merge that PR and it will update the records and will push to other APIs and dashboards. So these are two things that are really uh, critically important to us um, to getting your ledger address set up as a multi-sig and your GitHub organization and repo set up. This will allow you to use the front end to send out your data cap and it will allow the, the back end infrastructure to be standardized and consistent. So I'm gonna drop this uh, link in the chat. Um, this link is to another Airtable form um, where we are having you select um, your application number. This will link those records in our database, makes it a lot easier for us to like find and collate information and then enter the number again. This is just kind of a two-step match so that if you um, ideally are selecting the correct GitHub um, application issue number, punch in the org name, and then we have some options here for your multi-sig, um, what is the primary address where you will be receiving, hoping to receive that data cap. Otherwise, what is the primary signer if there are any additional signers that you want on that multi-sig and then a URL to the repo. And again, this is per pathway. If you are a team that applied and was accepted for multiple pathways because they are different, you will need a different repo and a different multi-sig for each of those pathways. Um, the slides, uh, we'll be posting the slides later. Yes, dropping the, uh, drop the link to their table there. We'll be posting these slides as well as some updates um, that have this. Don't see any other hands or questions yet, so I'm gonna keep moving on. Timelines for this onboarding. Today is the fifth. Um, as we go through this week, we're gonna be, fi we're finalizing, like I said, that beta tooling. We're getting these allocators to set up their repos as well as their multi-sigs. And starting this week and next week, allocators will begin receiving data cap. For the teams that are building something that's more market-based or more automated and won't be using our front end, once we have completed all the checks and they've given us their repo where they'll be keeping their records, we can hand them the data cap uh, can request that data cap from the root key holders um, for the teams that need to set these things up, need to install the apps. Um, once we get the URL for the repo, once we get the multi-sig or I create the multi-sig or I create the repo, we will also request the data cap from the root key holders. So anticipating by the end of next week that the majority of the teams that have completed all the checks um, are going to have data cap and be able to start making allocations. That said, LD 3.1 is no longer going to be refilled. Additionally, any of the open applications under that large data set, I am not going to manually recreate and port those over as new client applications to allocators. 
because I don't know who those clients want to work with. So clients that have open LDN applications are going to need to reapply to the specific allocators once we flip this switch. That's also part of the sunsetting of those past repos, archiving that LDN repo. Um, we're going to be making updates to the landing page. This is the philplus.storage landing page. It is going to have some new program information, but it is also going to have new links out to all the different allocator applications. Um, some of these allocators are building their own uh, front end where they'll receive applications. A lot of allocators are using our tooling, but they may want to tweak some of the questions on the form, like I said. In the current iteration, those are going to be issue templates in GitHub. Um, so a unique GitHub repo per pathway. There's going to be links from the landing page. Most of these diligence questions are then going to be able to be standardized, um, which will make the backend infrastructure as well as the auditing process cleaner. This is a current snapshot of the new application registry. Um, this is where Allocators will go to see all of their open client applications and action them. They can approve or deny and see more diligence details. This is a replacement of the registry at philplus.phil.org. So very excited to see this change. I think that there's going to be, in the, over the next like couple of months, there's going to be a lot of updates that we make to this. There's going to be a lot of bugs that we iron out. We've used a, a bug reporting system. We'll keep advertising where that you can go to submit those bugs um, as we find these edge cases. It's We're trying to get something like 70 different teams to use this software. It requires a lot of onboarding and backend support. So we appreciate the patience, but I think that it is going to pay off um, and have a, have a nice cleaner process for everyone um, while still having high confidence in the bookkeeping that's happening. So all the data cap distributions need to have a repo where we can go audit them. No matter what kind of allocation structure, what kind of diligence structure you're using, we need some way to go verify that you are performing diligence and that diligence is happening according to your stated application. Um, that's all of the prepared updates that I have at this point. We've got 30 minutes, um, plenty of time for Questions, Q&A, um, I'll paste this uh, this link again in the chat and see if there are any hands or questions in chat. I know it's a lot of information trying to give a balance between the context as to why this information is happening as well as explain what it is that we need. But I think we'll get there. Um, I know there's a number of teams that are ready to start giving out data cap. Um, I think it's gonna be exciting in the next couple of months to see which teams, how this tooling supports us, where the bugs are, um, work through those and then see which which pathways are really successful. Um, I'm really excited to see some of the automated and like market-based allocator tools. I think those are gonna be really interesting to kind of speed up the way that we perform diligence um, at these like smaller scales. And I'm really excited for some of the, you know, very large enterprise projects um, to see how we can start working with big enterprise clients uh, that need more of a high touch hand holding experience. Um, the V3.1 clients that don't run out of the data cap, at this time, we are not planning on um, removing data cap from clients at scale. So there have been various conversations and discussions about 
um, automated ways to remove data cap from clients. We may still push some of those proposals. There are uh, hurdles to removing data cap from clients. It requires two notaries as well as a message from the root key holders. Um, we have a team that's building some of that automated tooling. There have been proposals about this. We requested two notaries that we gave, um, I think like 32 GB of data cap uh, just for testing purposes. Uh, this allows them to be notaries, but they have not made any allocations out. They are bought notaries for the purpose of making a proposal and an approval to remove client data cap. And that's in situations where a client um, maybe received an incorrect allocation um, or the client is no longer active and has never made any deals uh, across a certain you know, life cycle. Um, it is not showing any response or signs of life, or it's a client that is making um, non-compliant deals. So we have some proposals from, from last fall about that. We have a team working on that tooling. But as of right now, to answer the question, we, we don't have a proposal or a plan to remove at scale all remaining data cap from clients. We are not planning on doing that from the 3.1 multisig. We may push these automated proposals that's, that use those determinations. If a client has never done any deal making, um, or if they have been, um, if they have lagged and they're not making any deal making, they're not replying, they're not getting back to messages and it's stale or latent data cap, we may have automated uh, requests. Those requests would still need to go to the root key holders. So they will not be fully automated. They may be an automated request from this bot that acts as two notaries to make the proposal. The root key holders would still need to go look and investigate um, how much data cap are we removing from a client and what is the reasoning behind it. So at this point in time, no plan to remove all past data cap from clients, um, but we are still working on that tooling so that we can make it faster to remove data cap from clients when necessary. Another question, each allocator see their own client application for approval on the new dashboard or if they can see others too? Um, this is a good question. In the past, because we were using one repo um, and because we were using sort of one main front end, anyone could sign in with GitHub, sign in with a ledger and see all of the pending allocation requests from clients. They wouldn't be able to sign them or send data cap unless their ledger was on that multi-sig. In this first version of the software, I don't think that we are going to have a view where anyone can see all of the open allocation requests to clients. Um, but I would like that uh, as a feature in a, in a next um, pretty soon release because I would like for allocators as well as various auditors to be able to see all of the pending allocation requests. We are trying to push more standardization that forces clients to use a unique client ID. And the reason for that is we want a tighter relationship between one client ID with one allocator ID. We don't want a client to use the same ID and apply to a lot of different allocators um, because on-chain, the way that it structures data cap is it's just first in, first out. So if a client receives data cap from multiple allocator addresses, and then one of those allocators determines that that client is non-compliant, if they've received different amounts or if they've used different amounts, it's not as simple as saying, well, I'm this allocator address and I gave you 50 TIBs and the deal making you did over here was from my 50 TIBs. If you got 50 TIBs from another allocator as well with a different set of requirements, when you go do deal making, you're not telling the deal engine what 50 TIBs to pull from. It's just one um, pot in your client address. So we are trying to have the tooling um, 
be more stringent on requiring new client IDs. Um, so that changes that I don't, you know, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but it does make it so that when a client comes and applies, we want them to use a new client ID. When an allocator comes and signs in, our most important concern first is that that allocator sees all of their clients in the dashboard. The next feature set is we would like um, allocators or the general public, anyone who signs into the tool, to be able to see all of the pending um, allocation requests. Uh, there is a question here about how to set up a multi-sig. Um, the Glyph team has um, built a really cool uh, front end. I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, they've built this web interface for managing multi-sigs. Um, I've used various Glyph tooling in the past. They have been in the ecosystem for a number of years. Um, I think they're a really good team that is making really interesting tools. Um, this tool allows you to connect your ledger. You'll have your ledger plugged into your computer and unlocked, and then you'll connect it through this browser, and it will allow you to then manage and create multi-sig um, addresses. So if you want to create your own multi-sig, um, this is a tool that you can use to do so. Uh, and then you can control who the signers and what the threshold is. My advice is not to set the threshold um, higher than two. Uh, I, I don't. I haven't seen any teams that want to do this. It reminds me of the hard old days of this program when we had the very early large data set where we needed seven notaries to uh, raise their hand and join a multi-sig and the threshold was four and we'd have all these proposals that would get three, uh, you know, we'd have all these allocation requests that would get three proposal messages and get lagged waiting for that fourth signer. And it just, it, you know, those high thresholds are, um, are rough. If that is your organizational standard and you need that many people to approve every transaction, that that's uh, up to you and your team and your application. Um, but I'm expecting that a lot of these multi-sigs are going to have a threshold of one, which means that it, a proposal message from that multi-sig with a threshold of one will um, instantly be resolved uh, once it lands on chain. So that front-end tool can help. I look forward to seeing more um, teams building more of these kinds of like web interface tools. Um, I think the Lotus team you know, does a great job for maintaining Lotus. Um, for what it is, but I like working in, you know, UX UI spaces, not command lines. Um, so I'm excited for for teams to build more of these. There's another question here about a three day SLA. An SLA uh, stands for Service Level Agreement. So when we say we are targeting a three day um, SLA, that's on. Um, da -da -da -da. Uh, back here on the compliance check, what we mean by that is we hope to have a three-day turnaround. So from the time that a pathway uses 75%, we're trying to build the tooling to have kind of that subsequent subsequent request. It will trigger a audit. We want to build tooling to make that audit, audit as automated as possible. Parts of it will still be manual, but we want to complete that audit within three days. So our service level agreement that we are trying to hit, that we're tracking towards, is three days. Um, and similar to the root key holders, we're setting an expectation on those root key holders. And we'll probably be making some changes to the addresses on that um, root key holder multi-sig. But we are targeting a three-day um, turnaround from that uh, group as well. So that's what we mean by SLA. Um, Yes, so there's a question here about a client works with one allocator, gets approved, and then goes and applies to another allocator. Um, there's a couple of things. Ideally, that client uses a new client ID. Ideally, that client is transparent about who they are, and so they use the same GitHub address. So let's assume that that is true. They use one GitHub address. They say, I am this client. This is the type of deal making that I'm going to do. 
they apply it to one allocator, they get data cap, they go and apply to another allocator with another client ID, and maybe they make different claims or the same claims. Um, but hopefully that one GitHub address is associating both of those applications. And if they're using this tooling, we want to be able to show and associate those two things together as a client. So we want to be able to let the allocators go do the diligence and see other requests that that client has made associated with their GitHub ID. Um, and that would allow us to then leave comments on their application. Um, we can, and this is where we want more proposals and feature requests, and we want to work with the, um, the Fiddle team, F-I-D-L team, um, to say, if you are the allocator and you go perform diligence checks on a client and you find out that they are non-compliant, how do you then alert other people in the ecosystem to that? And we want to be able to leave that as a comment on a client application issue, but we would also like that to in some way be captured um, and propagate out. And this is where having this switch to a JSON structure um, matters. So when, um, so in, in this new flow, when a client applies, and they submit this issue template, we could then have tooling to, if you find them to be non-compliant, you could leave a save reply. And maybe again, that's a web interface button that you click in the front end that says, you know, client non-compliant for this reason, here's the evidence. That would then be merged through that PR and into the JSON file, it would update that JSON record. And then when we kind of, scroll across all of these JSON records and we ingest all of them, we have more standardized information about these clients. What was the client ID that they used? What is the GitHub name they applied under? These are things that now are consistent across these allocator pathways. And then we can, when they show up later on on another pathway, we can say, we've seen this GitHub ID before and here's the information that we have about it. And here's the most recent flag where this allocator had an intervention and said, this person was non-compliant. Here's the reason why. Here's why we did not approve them for a subsequent allocation. That allows the new allocator to have all the information possible and say, do I want to trust this person with a first allocation or not? Maybe they have a justification. Maybe they said they were going to do five uh, storage provider locations. They ended up only working with three, but my pathway only requires three. So they were non-compliant to that other pathway that required them to have five SP locations, but they're actually, they would be compliant to mine. So there is a reason why a client might not be a good fit for every allocator pathway. That should be normal. We, we are trying to make not a one size fits all um, set of expectations because the same type of deal making and diligence and onboarding for enterprise doesn't apply to public open data necessarily it doesn't apply to these other automated flows or these market based flows so our goal is if we can have some standards and consistency we can arm everyone in the ecosystem with more information faster and more consistently um and that would allow the new allocator to say I am going to approve this person, even though this other allocator denied them. And here's my justification. And that would be a totally reasonable um, experience, both for a client and for the allocators. And so when we go to do a compliance check and we say, well, you worked with this person, they were previously denied, but you gave a reason why you worked with them. Your reason is justified. There's nothing non-compliant in that. Hopefully that answers your question, Wayne. Um, plus kid. So uh, at this point in time, two things for the allocators who are using the open source tooling. Set up a multi-sig that has your ledger address as a signer. Set up a repo where you want to, in GitHub, where you want to be doing the bookkeeping. Ledger multi-sig. GitHub repo, put that information in the Airtable form. Two weeks. By the end of next week, I'm going to do this manually. Um, so that's just 
the option. We are trying to push this through so that we can get people the data cap so those pathways can start working with clients. Um, so that's just what the turnaround time is. Great questions, everybody. Love to see them. We've got a few minutes remaining. If there are no other questions, though, we will um, happy to end a little bit early. All right, not seeing any hands come up and I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. Um, we'll be getting this posted. And like I said, we'll be posting um, some updates in Slack with some of this information and links to these slides. You can review these recordings, reach out to us if you have any questions, um, fill out that air table, let us know, myself and K-Ray, any, anything that comes up. Fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing and stop the recording. Thanks, everybody.